Hi, is this Jimmy? This is Jimmy. All How right. are you doing? We're good. Let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited thrilled actually to welcome our featured guest for this evening he is an actor he is a producer and he is an author we are so excited to welcome mr jimmy hawkins to our show you're on the air with terry and tiffany welcome jimmy how are you guys we're good we're good how are you well hanging in there like everybody else (laughs) yeah you know you know jimmy i wrote you on facebook and i told you it would be my extreme honor to have you on and I meant that so much because of my 64 years most of them was spent watching you on television <laughs> oh, well son of a god isn't that kind of you thank you very very much it's a pleasure to be on your show you know a lot you've of people a time. what was that you've been doing it a long time <laughs> yeah a long time it's been uh, 42 years for me on radio and we've been doing it on the internet here for 16 so it's it's been wow. a while but that's a lot of people to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. The thing is with with you is it's really interesting. I know a lot of people uh recognize you and 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 tag you with it's a wonderful life and that's certainly something to be proud of and something we sure. definitely want to be talking about. I mean especially now. I can't think of a, a better time for people to watch it's a wonderful life. If we ever needed it, we need it now with everything that's going on. But the thing is is like I said, I've been watching you for 64 years. I grew up watching shows like Annie Oakley. I grew up watching shows like Petticoat Junction. I grew up watching shows like The Ruggles. I grew up watching, because, you know, I'm that old. I grew up watching shows, you know, all these shows you were in and never had an idea that you were that little boy with all that hair in my favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I knew you from all these these TV shows. I never realized you were Tommy Bailey. Yeah, how about that? That is start some place. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I've been very fortunate uh, uh, to be in the business all my life, and I, I love it. I love being on a set. I just, just uh, am very grateful the opportunities I've had in my career and the people I've worked with. It just, you know, I was like, oh my God, here I'm on the set with so and so. Oh my God, this is great. I just loved it. It wasn't going to work; it was going to fun right. because all the shows were terrific back then uplifting positive kind of shows and uh it was it was a great pleasure to, to do them and uh i i enjoy talking about them especially it's wonderful life because of uh, the message as you said we need it more than ever now mm-hmm. and we certainly do we we all have to feel important and that's why that movie is so important it makes us know that we are needed that we can make a difference just like George Bailey learned. Right. Well, you certainly got me because uh, the other host here is my daughter. We always watch It's a Wonderful Life and, and cry like a baby every time. Yeah. You made me cry the other night with one of your uh, family sitcoms because of the attachment that I have with your character, Tommy, oh. and the attachment I have with the character of Mary Bailey with Donna Reed. I was yeah. watching the Donna Reed show, and I knew you were you know, a series regular on the Donna Reed show, wound up playing Shelley Fabray's boyfriend. But the episode, Change Partners and Dance, where you were dancing with Donna Reed, it, it made me cry because of It's a Wonderful Life and that connection. That had to be an extremely emotional thing for you. I know there was a story you can tell about when you walked into the table read and there was Donna Reed, your mom from It's a Wonderful Life. Talk a little bit about doing the Donna Reed show and particularly that episode. Well, that episode was the very first show they ever did. And uh, I just finished doing the Annie Oakley series. I was still going on tour and doing personal appearances at rodeos and stuff. But I got the call from my agent that uh, I was supposed to go over to Screen Gyms for an interview for a show called The Don Reed Show. Mm-hmm. It never, nobody knew about it. But anyway, so I went there and uh, got the part, in the very first episode. And, and, when we came to read around the table, everybody was sitting down. I saw Donna Reed at the other end of the, the table, and so I went up to her and I said, oh, excuse me, Miss Reed, my name is Jimmy Hawkins. I played your son, Tommy Bailey, mm-hmm. and it's a wonderful life. She <laughs> said, oh, yes, I know. She used to, uh, we used to call you Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> and I said, Rip Van Winkle? Why, why was that? <laughs> you know? She said, because you could sleep at any time with all this commotion going on people lighting getting ready for the shot and everything and you'd fall asleep and uh, when they needed you they woke you up and you were bright eyed and (laughs) bushy tail and 
that's how you got the name Rip Van Winkle. And I said, <laughs> oh my gosh. And uh, eight years later, I was still doing the show. It was that, great. It was just terrific. That's she incredible. She was a great lady, just a wonderful person. Now, I know there was yeah. that... I know there was that time as she mentioned about being uh, called Rip Van Winkle and everything. Uh, did she talk to you any other times on the set of uh, D- Donna Reed about the show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'd uh, sit waiting for the shot to be lit or whatever. We'd sit and shoot the breeze. Then, of course, uh, for years after the show went off the air, lunch or uh, we'd be at a fair together and we always ended up uh, sitting with each other. And she just was a, a great lady and fun to be with. Never uh, star time with her. She was very humble. You know, whatever things that she needed and wanted were done before. She never had to ask for anything while we were shooting. Like, oh, I told you my light should be this way or <laughs> you should shoot me this way. No, no, it was all taken care of. So she could just be her. And she was a nice lady, right. a real nice lady. And I understand that you uh, remained friends with her up until up until even she passed away. I mean, I had read a story about kind of the last time that you visited with her. Uh, it had a little bit to do with It's a Wonderful Life, right? Yes. Uh-huh. I uh, stayed in contact with her, and I visited her in the hospital. Uh, in fact, uh, Frank Capra had just written a book called The Name, and uh, I'd had... Uh, I, I was friends with John Ford, uh, and uh, uh, I was over at his house, and uh, I was asked to bring the book over there because uh, he was going to send it to Frank Capper to have Capper sign it. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, we talked a little bit, uh, you know, about the book, and he had written the foreword to the book, and so he had never read it actually. So he 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 read the book, uh, his foreword. And uh, then when he signed it at the end, he signed it again to me, and then sent it to Frank, and Frank had signed it. My dad worked with Jimmy Stewart on something, some special or something. My dad was the prop master. Oh. And uh, then when Donna was uh, sick in the hospital, I, I took the book for her to sign. And she, you know, took the pen and everything, and she was laying in bed. And she started to sign, and she said, Jimmy, I can't do it. I don't have the energy. Please excuse me. But come by the house, and and uh, I will have it signed for you. So uh, that next Christmas, uh, which wasn't too far from when I visited her in the hospital, I uh, stopped by her house on Christmas uh, Day, and uh, she never signed the book. She mm-hmm. just, that, was, that was it. She just didn't have the energy. And, and when I even saw her, at her house, I had brought her a new uh, Christmas tree ornament with the Bailey family on it. And I said, look, look what they came out with. And she looked at it, oh, it's beautiful. So I said, well, I brought it, and maybe I can put it on the tree. Do you have a special place you want? Okay. So she pointed to some place on the tree, and I put it on the tree, and I could see that she was very, very tired, very tired. Wow. So I, I went over, and I said, well, i got to get going now. And I just wanted to stop and see you, wish you a Merry Christmas. And I leaned down, and and uh, her hand just went up on my cheek. And there's a scene in the movie, It's Wonderful Life, where she held my cheek. And I was a little four-year-old kid. And I always remembered that soft, warm touch from that lady. That's all I knew. I didn't know it was Donna Reed or <laughs> whatever. Or, and, uh, and, but when she did that... I, and touched my cheek. I went, oh my God, this is the lady that did that. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And then I had to say goodbye. That's the last time I saw her. Mm -hmm. Two, three weeks later, she passed away. Mm -hmm. But she was great to the end. Just just a swell lady. Just the best. I mean, you know, it's a great cast. Shelley, of course, was my girlfriend on the Annie Oakley series. And I knew her back then. And then started her show. And then we've been lifetime friends. We've, you know gone to weddings together, been to functions, family functions, uh, the passing of both of our parents, and we just stayed uh, very close. And She's been a longtime friend and a good friend. And, uh, a great experience of like, you know, being in this business, and those are the kind of people I was able to meet. It was great. Right. Do you, great. you think, uh, you know, I could ask you this about Jimmy Stewart both, because I know that 
you definitely was working with them, you know, even after It's a Wonderful Life and intersected with them, you know, a couple of times. I know Jimmy Stewart three times that. Do you think Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed really knew what this movie was being the gift to the world that it is? No, uh, nobody did. I talked to everybody because I've written four books on it and I've talked to the, the writer of the film. I talked to uh, the cinematographer, uh, of course, Donna and Jimmy and a lot of other cast members. And I asked them that. I said, well, what do you think? It was a day's work or however long they were on the film. And, you know, you hope for the best. And it was Frank Capra's first movie and Jimmy Stewart's first movie yeah. uh, after World War II. Right. And they, they had problems. They were scared. They both were very frightened. To, they wondered if they still had it. And um, and it, it kept them on their toes. But uh, Stewart just he had a talk one day with Lionel Barrymore and uh, he, he just told him, he said, this seems just so frivolous now. Uh, he's telling Lionel Barrymore. He said, I, you know, being in the war and seeing all of the death and everything, it just this seems like nothing. What kind of a life is this doing movies? He, he was really thinking of going back to Indiana, Pennsylvania and, and working with his dad in the, his uh, hardware store. Right. And, and uh, 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 Lionel Barrymore sat him down. He said, look, Jimmy, you, you've got a great gift. This is your calling in life. You you can talk to people for two hours in the dark. They love to hear you. No, no, you're doing something very important. You're entertaining people and giving them escapism in, into your movies. No, no, don't ever feel that way. And uh, that was all Jimmy Stewart needed because he respected Lionel Barrymore so much that, well, maybe, you know, so, but the war does things to people, apparently. Right. It was tough. And same with Frank Capra. He First time he looked through a lens of a camera in five years, and he, he wondered, do I have it? And then when the picture came out and was a flop, he, he couldn't believe it. He said, this is the greatest film I've ever made. He said, in fact, I think it's the greatest film anybody's ever made. And how can this be? How How is it that it isn't popular that... It lost a half a million dollars. You know, got up for five Academy Awards and everything, but it, it didn't win any. And he just, it just devastated him. And it just shows you in life, if that picture had become a hit, done very well, it would never be what it is today. It took uh, the uh, studio let it, lapsing the copyright. Mm -hmm. and then they could show the movie for free on television. Right. And, and it caught on and um, it just grew bigger and bigger and bigger and Sheldon Leonard uh, when I was talking to him about the movie uh, he played Nick the bartender oh yes he was great love I, I, I love his, his gangster <laughs> accent oh so. yeah always wasn't that great he was he's great <laughs> and so I was telling him why, why is this thing he said listen Jimmy the picture never changed it was the people who changed yeah and he was right, and just like we talked earlier, the people in uh, when it became a hit in the late seventies started to grow during the eighties <clears> and the nineties. They needed that message more than ever that they're important. You see, you don't think that you're doing anything in life. George Bailey didn't think he did anything for anybody. He's just trying to get out of the town and, <laughs> and, and live a life and find <clears> his happiness. And he had it all along, you know. Let me ask you about the uh, the copyright thing because I was doing an article for a magazine on It's a Wonderful Life uh, back in the '90s, and I was working uh, with uh, George Clooney's dad, Nick Clooney. He was a host of, of American Movie Classics, and uh, his son was about to introduce the first showing of It's a Wonderful Life on NBC because NBC bought up all the rights to show it like forever. And Nick Clooney from American Movie Classics was really upset that they could no longer show it because he felt it was a gift to the world. It is very true that it got so popular because it was free and it was public domain. How do you feel oh, yeah. about that? Uh, well, I think it's great <laughs> because uh, um, the copyright lapsed and people could see it for free. But uh, then in 93, uh, Paramount, or... Uh, Republic Pictures, right. who Aaron Spelling, he owns that. Uh, he rebought the copyright, changed 
uh, uh, bought three cues of music and uh, told everybody in the world that they own it now and that if they put it out on DVD or, or, or VHS and try to sell it, they will uh, be sued. Yeah. Then they own it now. It went out of public domain, which it never did. Uh, and it's it's an incredible story. But uh, nobody wants to fight them and call them on it because all they'll win is it goes back into public domain. It isn't like, well, we won, now we own it. No, right. Right. no it just went back into public domain. And so they say, well, we're going to fight this for two, three hundred thousand dollars And then what did we win? The right to put it out like uh, it was before. Hundreds of other VH companies, you know, all had it in their library. So they'd sell all their other stuff and say, oh, we'll sell you It's a Wonderful Life, too. Oh, yeah, okay, that's great. So that's why there's so many different kinds of, <laughs> you know, nice copies of it, bad copies. But now Paramount has really taken over the, uh, the picture and done miracles with it and even colorized it. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful. And I've, uh, even this year, they came out with a new 4K Blu-ray uh, steel book. And I was talking to a lot of different people about it, how beautiful the picture was. And the steel book is kind of, I think, it's a big collector's item. Right. And to have the steel book, oh, wow. And because it's the same one that was out the year before, mm -hmm. 4K Blu-ray. And uh, I promoted that for them. Well, I, I enjoyed the big promotion blitz uh, they had with Target and Walgreens, and I was there buying all that stuff. I've got the it's, <laughs> I've got the it's a Wonderful Life buildings, you know, from the town, and I've got the, the oh, Christmas yeah. all of that. Well, that. Target came to me in ninety something when, and they said we want to do it's a Wonderful Life at Target. This was in February. They said it's late. We're getting a late start. We did have another theme, and then we changed over. Mm -hmm. And then we found out that you were the go-to guy to talk to, that you know everybody, you can uh, help us put this thing together uh, right away. And so we want to know, number one, would you do it, and how, how should we do it? What hook can you bring to this that will make everybody uh, go to Target? for It's a Wonderful Life at Target. Mm -hmm. So they set up a meeting for the next week. They said, please, put your thinking cap on and tell us what, what we're to do here and, and how to do it. So they said, oh, you know uh, uh, Donna Reed's uh, family? Oh, yeah, sure, I know the husband. And Yeah, so set up a meeting with him and just you know made it real quick because I knew everyone. So... Uh, I came up with the idea. I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to uh, go on the road, and we'll go to all the towns you want us to go to where you have Target stores, and uh, I'll bring my siblings from the movie. And the Bailey kids will be reunited after 46 years, and we'll go to your towns and do the morning shows and, and tell everybody, today we're in town, and we're going to be at the Target store, and wherever in florida or minnesota or, or all over we and, and we're talking Florida. we're talking tommy bailey and zuzu bailey and janey and Janie bailey and uh, larry sims the mm -hmm. older boy uh so we hit the road for target and met everybody and just people went crazy i bet and um we, greeting the people they um just love the bailey kids and we never, ever, and not to this day, take any credit for anything. We just believe in Frank Capra's message. We believe in the power of the movie. And we talk to people and, and let them know, in our opinion, why the movie hit and what it was about. And we, we do that as, as much as we can. And that's why it's a pleasure to be on your guys' show, because now you're part of the legacy. You're mm -hmm. carrying on the thing with your thousands and thousands of listeners and followers that that's great now now you are a part of it you're carrying 
Frank Capra's message. Well, we hope to continue on because five years ago we had uh, Carolyn Grimes on, and now we have yeah. you, and, and we want to continue on and, and maybe get you know the actress to play Janie like and so Holmes. forth. Yeah. But uh, absolutely, yeah. Now, I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of your other stuff. Now we had mentioned Annie Oakley, and the thing that was so great is is the episode I saw the other night. I could not believe that you had started working with Shelley Fabres that long ago. Uh, she was yeah. in the uh, Treasure Map episode, and here was this little girl and this little boy. I, I think that, that you guys were kind of destined to know each other. I mean, all the way through your life, you you did two Elvis movies with her. You did Annie yeah. Oakley. You did the Donna Reed show. Oh my God! I mean. This has got to be like your best friend in the business because you were always hanging out with her. Always. And uh, uh, when we were doing Girl Happy, we were both excited. I mean, here we are uh, doing a movie with Elvis. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> this is great. So she was uh, between shots, and she uh, came to my dressing room. We were shooting the breeze. Oh, there's a little knock on there were dressing rooms that they put on the set right. on rolls, and uh, so we were just sitting there talking and stuff going oh god this is great isn't it you know and then there's a little knock on the door and we both looked up and it was Elvis <laughs> standing there no none of his entourage or anything he said oh, uh, excuse me you guys but uh, do you mind if I come in and we talk <laughs> <laughs> I said oh, please I'm busy with her please <laughs> no, and I was there and he's sitting there shooting the breeze for 15, 20 minutes so they came to uh, the uh, our you know, where we were sitting mm -hmm. uh, dressing room and then we've all walked out and went to the, I just this I just said, this is great I mean, my God you know, it, it's great, but it could also be not great because you're sitting there with one of the prettiest girls in television, and Elvis shows up. <laughs> so all of a sudden, <laughs> well, well, Shelly and I had uh, been to a lot of the uh, uh, Emmy Awards. We'd go uh, two, three years in a row, and uh, uh, we're just we're just great friends. We just hung out together and went places, and uh, it was just a great experience. It was great. Now, I've got to uh, find out, because we had your uh, co-star from Girl Happy, Joby Baker, on the show. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and Joby had uh, kind of a, a confrontation with, with Colonel Parker, with Elvis's manager, Colonel Parker. And yeah. uh, uh, Joby was talking to Elvis because like he had got a memo from Colonel Parker, and it referred to Joby and making it sound like he thought Joby was a girl. It referred to him as Miss Baker because he got fooled by the name Joby. I guess he'd never met him or something. He referred to Joby as Miss Baker. So uh, I guess Joby talked to Elvis about it like he thought Elvis could do something about it. And Elvis looked at him and he was laughing. He says, okay, Miss Baker, I'll tell him that you don't like it. <laughs> so did you have any confrontations with Colonel Parker? Because I know Colonel Parker could be pretty rough. No, he was very good to me. He was great. I'd go over to his office and shoot the breeze with him. Uh, and, uh, no, he was great. And uh, at the end of the movies, he'd always have some prop. He would wear these dusters. Uh -huh. You know what a duster is? Yeah. Kind of a long, a yeah. long white. long jacket, yeah. He would drive cars in the old days for him. And then we would sign those for him. Mm. For a Girl Happy and then all the... The, the stars of the, the movie or the actors in the movie that he wanted to sign it would sign it and uh, the director and then same with Spin Out there was always something that he signed mm -hmm. and um, um, no I no, I, I give a lot to everybody I, he's very nice he's nice to me so um, I didn't have any confrontation really with anybody well, yeah. I I definitely love Spin Out, and but Girl Happy is like my favorite. That that's just like oh my, I, I didn't like Spin Out. Yeah, I, at all. I, I it was fun doing it, you know, kind of. But I, I didn't like the script, and it just I don't know. Not it had nothing uh, compared to Girl Happy. Girl mm -hmm. Happy was just fabulous. It was a great story. It all worked. Um, in fact, I was the first one signed to do the movie. I had met with the uh, producer and director and we were talking uh, in this interview and all of a sudden Joe Pasternak was the producer he's one of the big producers on the MGM lot for mm -hmm. 30, 40 years and he said he stopped the conversation he said 
uh, were you on Petticoat Junction the mm-hmm. other night? I said, well, yes, I was. He turned to the room and said he can play anything. Just explain to him the three guys, and then he'll tell you which one he can do. He said, great. Hey, this is good. Now uh, make uh, a, a meeting with you and the director. He'll explain what the movie's about. And oh, God, I, I love your work. And that was the end of the meeting until I met with the director, and then the director told me about the three characters. And he said, which one uh, do you want to play? I said, well, I think I'm right for Doc. Right. Said, okay, great. So then they were going to test a girl to star opposite Elvis. And um, um, so they asked who do the Elvis part, and then there was another scene, and would you play this other character in the other scene? Oh, okay. So they tested this girl, and... Um, uh, Boris Segal was the director. Very mm-hmm. nice guy. Mm-hmm. And um, we were doing the test, and the girl was real good. She's very good, but not for this part, uh, in my opinion. And so we were doing it, and they said, okay, close up uh, of the girl. And uh, so I stepped out, and it was all dark, you know. It's so light on, on the other side of the camera, but then when you step out to, you know, get away from the lights it's just dark it's mm-hmm. black so i stepped about two steps and all of a sudden the director stepped in front of me and i oh, oh. Well, you know I, yes he said tell me about shelly Favre." <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i knew this girl was all wrong yeah. very good actress did you know it was great but not for this part and i and and now i knew the girl that uh we were uh, testing mm-hmm I, I was friends with her too, and I knew <laughs> Shelley. And I'm going, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be disloyal to anybody. But I said, well, if this doesn't work out, Shelley is this part, right? He said, Thank you, Jimmy. And boom. Now so, I, I know Shelley was very, I know Shelley yeah. was very professional. But around Elvis, did, did she kind of have a girl crush on Elvis at all? Not at all. She had just gotten married to Lou Adler. Ah, there you go. Okay, I didn't know that. Wow. She never was that type of gal. That no, no, she right. was, and uh, that's why they stayed friends. I think because he always liked her. Right. He, you know, hey, she's the only leading lady he had in three movies. That's right. right. You know, the combination of, of you and Elvis and Joey uh, Joby Baker and Gary Crosby. Uh, you came off very real. I mean, it was totally authentic. You totally made it believable that you guys were chums and hanging out in Fort Lauderdale. What about hijinks? Because I know about Elvis, and I got a feeling that Gary Crosby was a cut-up. And I know Joby Baker's a cut-up, because we know him a little bit. Uh, was there any uh, hijinks or stories you can tell about you guys, maybe off-camera or during a scene that kind of went wrong? Uh, well, <laughs> um, that a little trouble with Gary Crosby. Um, he, I don't know, just one scene, he just, the director kept saying, no, no, do it do it this way. I want you to fall down the hill like this and, you know, and then you kiss the girl and say the line. And we did that four or five, a bunch of times. And he just never got it. And he did something I thought, was, I just think that was good to do, you mm-hmm. know, because uh, you do a take and it isn't good and they say print it, you're stuck with that. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. He kind of took it out on the director and did the, the, the thing and then they yelled cut and he looked up at the director, well, that's it? Huh? That's what you wanted? The director oh. said, yeah, print it. And it wasn't good. He just just wasn't right. And I said, oh boy, that's not a very good thing because that's going to be on the film forever. Yeah. Right. So, you know, he just, I, I, they had trouble. Now, Joe B. and Gary became real close friends during the, the whole filming. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a great set outside of that, that incident. And um, um, it, was, it was fun. The, the director kept it fun. Uh, and it was just a, a fun script to do. It was real good. I, I, I liked Elvis movies. And I say that of all the movies, it was probably four or five in the list of his best. Right. His yes. best was King Creole by, oh, he was great in King Creole. That was a great movie. 
Well, by the time that you wound up doing Girl Happy, Elvis was very established. Uh, oh, yeah. Who was the man you expected, and who was the man you actually met? Everybody gives their stories about what he was like. They all say he was nice and polite and everything. But, uh, you know, by the time that you met him, you had to have great expectations. And did he turn out to be what you thought, or, or different? Yeah, oh, yeah, he was very nice. I mean, he would, uh, on weekends, he would go to karate class. So then, <laughs> yes. uh, my name and... and he said, oh, Jimmy, I've got to show you. And then he would show me what he learned on that weekend. And then he'd have, he'd call one of his guys over, come here. And then they'd go through it, and he'd be choking him or something. And, <laughs> and it was like a little kid. Said, oh, guys, look what I learned. And at the karate class. And uh, very, very nice. Uh, uh, kept, you know, very light. Um, a just very nice person I you know you felt bad that he got caught up in in, in the drug thing mm -hmm. and everything it's just too bad because he was a very very nice person no star time he he was just very nice now, well, knowing, comparing you know what the public image is versus the person that you know uh, and talking about you know quintessential rock stars you were also very good friends with Ricky Nelson um, now, yeah. I, I assume that you met him from being on The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, but talk a little bit about Ricky and your relationship and friendship with him and, and what he was like off camera, out of public image. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was doing a movie at Columbia called Zots for William and got a call from my agent and said, Ozzy Nelson wants to meet you. Uh, can you go over there? So I asked the agent he'd be how, uh, after lunch and he said no no you're fine till maybe 3 o'clock I said oh okay so I told the agent I, okay I can meet him at uh, 1 o'clock whatever okay and he said okay so he called back alright uh, go over to general service studio at 1 o'clock and meet Ozzy Nelson oh okay <laughs> oh my god I meet mean, Ozzy Nelson <laughs> 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 so uh I get over there, and Leo Pepin, who's the head of the production and everything, I was in his office, and he said, oh, Oz will be here in just a second. He wants to meet you, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, so we shot the breeze, and all of a sudden, in comes Ozzy Nelson. He goes, oh, hi, Jimmy. And I'm like, <laughs> we lost my friends. So, you know, oh, Mr. Nelson, how are you? You know, He said, I saw you on Donna Reed's show last night. And we, uh, the four preps do this show, and they've been called into the National Guard, and, and so I need to replace them. So I, I want to know, how would you like to do our show? I said, well, I'd love to do your show. He said, okay, well, uh, give them the script, and then they'll tell you when we're going to do the show, and uh, welcome. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, there I am. I'm Ventures of Ozzy and Harriet, and I did a bunch of those over the next three years or so, and... Um, the, the family were, were wonderful people. Uh, uh, Mrs. Nelson, she'd do little dances, and, and uh, uh, just, it was a nice set. It was, it was fun. There were, <clears throat> all the shows I did, uh, Donna Reed, Gidget, uh, Petticoat Junction, uh, my, th uh, my three, no, not my three sons. Um, oh, Dennis and Menace. We're all shot. Uh, within three days. Right. Wow. And, but two shows, The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet and My Three Sons were different than all the shows. You know, I talked and to a few people that was on Ozzy and Harriet, one of them being Barry Livingston from My Three Sons, and they all talked about how wonderful the family was and how nice Ozzy was. I don't know if you ever saw that god-awful TV biopic of Ricky Nelson. But they totally yeah. portrayed Ozzy as being domineering over the family, uh, the family rejecting, being told what to do, that Ricky couldn't wait to get away from Ozzy. So you didn't get that sense at all, right? Uh, well, no, we didn't see it, but it was happening. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, um, but, um, yeah, uh, there, there was, you know, Ricky wanted to do his own thing, and Ozzy wanted to keep him doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, I, I don't know. Um, it, it, we just had a great time on the show, but but 
the difference of all the shows was Ozzy and Harry. Right. We would shoot every day. And the show would shoot, uh, usually, you know, uh, this show would shoot five, six, maybe seven days. Never uh, rehearsals or anything like that. Uh, you'd rehearse the scene before you did it, but you would shoot five, six days. And that's, that you go, that's in, incredible. Um, so that was different. And also, my three sons. My three sons, you get a call, they say they want you for this episode, and it's uh, three days shooting. Okay, they need you uh, uh, January 12th and May 3rd and 4th. Mm-hmm. I said, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's supposed to be three days. No. What's going on? Yeah, that's right. And so what they did is for three months, that was Fred McMurray's deal. You get all my stuff done in three months, and I'll do the show. So they did everything he was in. So if you were in a scene with him, you would have to do it uh, uh, January, whatever the date is. Right. And then you, then they got his three months over, and then they started doing the all the shots that he wasn't in, that I, I may have been in. That's and, what everybody's told me. That's right. Right, and they had to do the show that way. And you would you had to have the same wardrobe, same haircut, and everything. Because you walk <laughs> through the door and then come out the end. It's four months later, but you had to look like you did the, the day you, you know, walked out the door. So that, well, from Fred McMurray's standpoint, that's kind of genius. Yeah. <laughs> well, and he, if they wanted him, that's what they had to do. Right. You know, he had a movie career, Disney and... He was very much in demand, and um, so they, that's fine. But well, it's just unique how certain shows are, and you just had to make yourself. I had to do a Donna Reed show, and then two weeks before, they said, oh, uh, Jimmy available for uh, the second and third of, oh, no, he's doing another. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, and then the, sometimes they would say, okay, well, uh, we'll shoot the other stuff first on Donna Reed, and then will get him on the fourth and fifth. Uh, well, we watched one of our other favorite uh, TV shows yep. the other night that you were on, Petticoat Junction. I am such yep. a fan. Now, the first time I saw you on Petticoat Junction, you were part of a couple of guys that trying to rob uh, the cannonball, trying to rob the train. <laughs> and, and, and your character was so interesting because everything you said, you immediately repeated. I had a friend that did that. It was so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, how about that? Yeah, Dick Weston, I came in to meet him. Uh, he was a, a wonderful actor at Warner Brothers, and then he turned to writing and producing, and he was the first producer on the first season. And he wrote a lot, he directed them. He was a very gifted man. Mm-hmm. Great guy, great guy. So I walked in, oh, how do you do? And everything, oh, it's fine. And he's very businesslike, but nice. And he said, okay, uh, what you read the script? And oh, I said, I don't do cold reading. He said, what? I, I don't do cold reading. You know, it's comedy, and, and I feel it's timing, and, and I got to know what the scene's about and get a rhythm. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. All right, well, go outside, do it, and then come back when you, you're ready. <laughs> so I did, and, and so I got the show. And he liked it so much, he made me a regular that season. And I became a guy named Orville Meeks, with, uh, uh, and I was kind of the buddy uh, to Joe, you know, Uncle Joe, <laughs> Edgar Buchanan. Right. And uh, they, they were great. In fact, I did the show for three or four years, you know, and but I wasn't that character. I always became somebody else. They just liked me and you know, kept me working on the show. Did, did you not kind of become, uh, did you not kind of become the first love of Linda K. Henning? Well, yes. Uh, she tells everybody, she said, oh, there's Jimmy, he gave me my first kiss. On the screen. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and they wrote uh, that show uh, with me in mind uh, called Betty Joe's First Love, I think it was called. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. And then I was a beatnik. On another show with another girl, I dated all the girls in the show wow. and all the different sets of girls because some would leave and then they'd right. have right. a new one. and so I'd be there 
boyfriend or whatever. It's, it's, it's crazy. And you got and, pa- uh, and you got paid to do it. Imagine that. I mean, wow. <laughs> right. I had to do it. Sorry. <laughs> How you much? Know, in talking, uh, yeah. in talking, right. in talking. Mean, in talking about interesting shows and, and things, I wanted to go back for just a second to Annie Oakley. Yes. Um, because I believe I, this was shot at Melody Ranch, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Well, talk a little uh, bit because... Talk a little bit about the show. And also, as an animal lover, I have to ask you about the relationship you had with your horse. I'm assuming that you actually rode because I read that you toured all around with your horse, right? That's right. We do state and county fairs. Uh, they came to my mom and said, you know, Mrs. Hawkins, uh, the show's pretty popular, and we feel that Jimmy should get an act together and do uh, appearances when we're not shooting the show. And so, oh, well, okay. So uh, decided to buy a horse. So uh, my trainer uh, went out and he found a horse. They said, this horse is great. Now, the horse had shipping fever. He said he could die, but if he lives, this show's going to be great, this horse. And it was. He went. We went into hospitals, Shriners Hospital. Mm-hmm. That's one thing we did when we go into a town. We'd always go to uh, children's hospitals and entertain the kids who couldn't come to the show. Right. And uh, I would go by myself or Gail and I would go out on tour or Gene Autry and I would go out on tour. Uh, and we'd be gone for maybe two, three months at a time, and we just go from town to town to town for state fair, county fair, or local fairs. We'd always just, they had this whole agenda for us, and we'd travel all through the United States, you know, from L.A. to New York, to New Jersey State Fair, or whatever, and uh, I, I enjoyed that, because it was live, and, and my horse was trained tricks. See, say yes or no, bow, say his prayers, count, um, and and then for a finale, we jump through a hoop of fire. Holy oh my cow. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, and, and the flames start getting bigger and bigger all the time. They, they have like a kind of gag, let's see, like you can jump through this one, <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, like I'm 15 or 16 at the time. Yeah. It, it was great, but Pixie was a terrific horse, just the best. Um, uh, I uh, when we do the shows, I'd ride them around to the different locations. When when we weren't shooting, I'd just go on and go up through the hills, and, and he was great. He was well, I know where the ranch is, and I've been there, and you know, been around Canyon Country and the Santa Clarita area and everything. Uh, when right. you do shows like that, now here you're out there, and you're amongst all those rocks and everything. We kind of live in the area too. We live up here in Lake Hughes. And we've been down oh, that I other. Happened in uh, in um, uh, right over the hill, Green Valley. You know where oh, that yes. is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We had a cabin we built after World War II, and uh, we were always going up there on weekends. And in fact, after we shot Spin Out, uh, Deborah Wally and Diane McBain and I got to be good friends, and we had a big. Uh, Halloween party up there, oh. and, and uh, 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 horses uh, drawn and had uh, hay. We had a live band up there. It was incredible. I mean, it was it was a great night, and it was terrific. So I know where that is. I, in fact, Roy Rogers had a ranch in Lake Hughes, right? Right, yes. absolutely. Yeah. But the thing that we the thing that we've learned with living up here is. Everybody's worried about rattlesnakes. Now, you're out there You're out there filming. Did you ever run into any rattlesnakes? Or even when you're out there, at, you know, with uh, hanging out or partying with, with the girls. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, we'd go up there all the time. And uh, But, yeah, uh, up in Pioneer Town, was they, uh, they had a motel that we... And you would take a shower, and then... Uh, and when you stepped in the shower, it was kind of a, a board, you know, kind of, you know, like when a forklift comes over and lifts up a, a board or forklift. You, mm-hmm. you ever seen those yes, things? Yes, yeah. A pallet-like. Well, those things, the uh, showers. And one time, there was a rattlesnake underneath oh, that thing. Oh, no. <laughs> was in the shower. And that was something. 
you know. Wow. So they were around, but never had any trouble, you know, because we were up in the hills. But, you know, you have so many guys and crew people around. They, you know, it isn't like they want to stay around where a lot of people are. Right, right. right. Uh, well, I, I've so, got to ask you, Jimmy, because you said the magic word that, that is a big part of my heart. I love so much and have always loved Deborah Wally. Now, oh, I'm so yeah, sad that yeah. she's gone. I miss her so much. She was great with you in Spin Out. I want to yeah. find out now. I find out especially that you were friends with her and, and you did Halloween parties and stuff. Talk to me about Deborah. Uh, uh, I first met her. I threw a, a birthday people that I had met. She... Uh, came into town. She was a New York actress. What what I'd always do is I go through the Academy directory, and that's where all the actors have their pictures and casting people all through the industry have this Academy a directory. And there would be leading men, leading women, ingenues, and and uh, younger leading men. And so I, I would get the newest one. And in fact, I introduced that to the Ozzie and Harriet show to Charlie Britt. He was a Rams player, uh, Rookie of the Year, and he and Ricky were roommates uh, when I started doing the show. And, uh, you know, they were always so, oh, hey, uh, you meet any good... And Mr. Nelson was always very nice that way. He said, mm -hmm. do you work with any actresses you think might be good for this show? Let me know, Jimmy. You know, I said, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so we'd meet some girls, and then they'd end up on The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. And um, 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 where were we? I mean, how how did I get from here to Deborah Wally? Do you think? Any, anyway, Deborah was a real nice guy. Oh yeah, uh, I met I her at this girl's uh, that I had come out from New York and and started dating her, Joey Heatherton, and she uh, and uh, Nick Adams were friends, and he was a good friend of mine. He married the girl that I was in the Ruggles series with. He married her sister. Mm. And so, you know, everybody knew everybody. And I met uh, Deborah up at our house when I threw this surprise birthday party for, for Joey. And Joey had been doing a movie with Nick Adams. And so Nick Adams' good friend was John Ashley, and he was married to Deborah Walker. Right, right. Yeah. So that's when I first met her. And then they separated or something. And um, uh, then I met her on uh, spin out and uh, she she was a very nice person uh, and so was Diane McBain but uh, she was great in that part wasn't she absolutely yeah. Diane McBain's a great lady too Diane's been on the show oh yeah, yeah she's I really I really like and, and, and man you dated Joey Heatherton what a lucky man yeah I'm lucky I mean you meet all these girls and you go wow <laughs> no uh, wait I had read, and tell me if this is wrong, because, you know, sometimes you see things on the Internet that's not true, but I had read that you you would even give Ricky Nelson dating advice. Is that right? Uh, well, he uh, had this, uh, where I was up at the house, and he said, I want to talk to you about something. And he said, I, I want to give uh, Chris something. That was the girl he was dating. Right. Chris Hart, and he ended up marrying. He said, uh... uh Here's what I want to give her. And it was a ring. He said, but I don't want to have her uh, think it's any more than just, you know, real good friends. I, I just don't want to go there right now. And so what do, you, what do you think I should do? I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, I really want to give her the ring. I said, then give it to her and just tell her. <laughs> uh, you know, I think you're special. And I saw this and I thought it was mm, okay. So he did it and got away with it. And, but then they ended up getting married and, so it was great. It was, it was she was a nice girl. They were a good couple, and you hated to see them break up. Yeah. yeah. You know, she had a nice family, and uh, uh, Ricky was a very nice guy. Very mm -hmm. no cockiness about who he was. Very humble. Very humble. Um, and um, he, he was just like you see him on the show. Right. Exactly like. Well, we do uh, a year-end tribute to all the uh, celebrities that pass away during the year. And one name we're going to have to mention that you had an association with because you were uh, associate producer on the Evil Knievel movie, which I love with George Hamilton. Uh, we're talking about Sue Lyon. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. She was quite a piece of work. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to produce. And so, in 1968, I took a uh, USO show to Vietnam. Right. And that was going to be my last thing as an actor. And now I'm going to become this producer and find projects and everything. So, I did that. Came back from Vietnam and uh, started uh, finding projects. I went over to Universal, and a friend of mine was there, and I was going to have I had lunch with him. And I said, "So, what are you doing?" He said, oh, "I'm doing a project with uh, George Hamilton." I said, "Oh, really? Well, what is it?" He saw it's uh, the thing called Evil Knievel. Said, Evil Knievel, what's that? He said, "Oh, this guy jumps motorcycles." Really? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me about it. So he started telling me about it, and I said, oh, my God, this is a great project. I, I, I like this. This is a nice story I, I, for what you told me. He said, well, um, so we talked more about it, and I said, I, I can raise the money for that. He said, do you think so? I said, yep, yep, I can. Uh, so he said, well, let me talk to George and tell him that uh, I've got a friend that's going to go out and try and promote money for the movie so that if somebody asks, he'll go, Jimmy, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he's, we're, we're together on this. Yeah. So I sent the movie to three people. Uh, all three were interested. Two said they would put up the money, uh, and the other guy said, I'll put up the money, but I don't want George Hamilton. <laughs> I said, well, he owns the prize. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know. So this guy I met uh, named Joe Salomon, he did low budget pictures with motorcycles mm -hmm. and you know held the angels on wheels or whatever mm -hmm. so i gave him the script i gave it to his secretary this gal and uh, i said I'll read it over the weekend and uh, then we'll talk okay so over the weekend the lead story in the calendar section of the la times was all about this guy evil knievel and the girl came back into the office and told Joe, hey, look, this is that project Jimmy brought in Friday. Look at this thing. He said, oh, really? Let's, I want to know more about it. So I uh, invited Joe over to Universal, and George had some footage, and he had dressed up like evil. He had the whites with the you know, red, white, and blue cross mm -hmm. in the front. And he had that leathers. And so he would ride the motorcycle with Evil, and uh, and there were some jumps that Evil had made that they had uh, film of in the Las Vegas one. And so uh, he came over, and we got a screening room and showed him this thing. It's about five or six minutes. And Joe stepped up and said, I like it. I'll, I'll put the money in. You know, this is going to be the biggest movie this Joe Salmon ever did. Other pictures cost 100000 200000 This one cost 750000 Okay? So, um, uh, now we have to get a script. So we hired this writer, and the script was terrible. It just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And Joe had an idea for a guy. And <clears throat> so we went with that guy, and he came up with a script. But John Milius was a young writer at the time. He'd done a lot of work on uh, rewrites on Pat, and he was a great writer. And he came up with the storyline, but he couldn't, at that time, write the script. But he became free, and then he rewrote what Joe Solomon's guy did. And then we had the script we wanted. And uh, so they green-lighted it, and uh, for t 20 three or four days we shot this film all over LA and then we went to Butte Montana for a week mm. and then shot the rest of the movie and uh, the, the this Joe Solomon was a real hustler I mean he was great he just had a lousy attitude he just you hated the guy <laughs> <laughs> just a jerk and for no reason I mean you go why do you why are you so mean here we are doing this great movie and but something happened at the Grommets Chinese they were showing the Wild Rovers with Ryan O'Neill mm -hmm. and and um, 
uh, it did real bad business. So they yanked it. And Joe Solomon got our picture in, and it opened at the Gromis Chinese Theater wow. in Hollywood. Wow. And this thing, uh, I would go and check the house. I'd know what time it was ending. You know, the 8 o'clock show ended at this time, so I'd go see the people coming out and other people coming in. Well, this one night, you know, this is, it was there for four or five weeks. So it, it kind of built. And this one night, the people were around the block waiting to get into the, the 10 o'clock show, and the people were inside watching the end. And I knew the doorman by that time. I said, I'm going to go and check the house. He did. So I'm standing in the back of the theater, and the end of the thing, and George is taken off in the movie uh, to jump the canyon. And, and, and then uh, my thing will be glorious. And all of a sudden, it's dark, and the titles start to come on, and I hear, broom, broom, broom. And I look over, and here's George on the sickle that he just, we saw in the scene, on the screen. And he went down the aisle <laughs> in front of the screen, and the lights came up, and there he is standing in the white, and the people went crazy. Wow. Oh my gosh. They all followed him out of the theater. Now the people are trying to get into the theater for the next show and then it ended up a picture of him in this sea of people on the uh, cover of Box Office Magazine that week. This picture just took off. It made like 30 some odd million dollars in three or four or five weeks. And it's a great and movie. Seven hundred and fifty thousand to make. Wow. It was, wasn't it? Yes, it was absolutely. Really well done. We found the director we wanted. We wanted somebody out of television that we thought would make it big in movies, and we found this one guy, Marvin Chomsky, and uh, he directed it. Did a fine job, and everybody did a good job. It just clicked. It just happened, and it was about this rebel guy, and and. Uh, uh, it, it, it was an ex really a, an experience. And when we were up in Butte, Montana, Evo came on the set uh, uh, one day and uh, uh, kind of, he was, he was there. And he, he was supposed to deliver a lot. Yeah. He never did, did, did deliver. Did, did you have any kind of issue with Sue Lyon? Because I thought I'd heard you say when you started talking about it, I think you used the phrase, she was a piece of work. Yeah, she was. She was kind of. She was a nice girl, you know. She's she was very nice, but she was, you know, she's kind of strange. I mean, she married a guy in prison and and uh, had a romance. Of, she he was in there for, you know, life or some <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> thing. Now she ends up marrying him. I mean, she was just this kind of screwy that way. Right. Uh, but a nice person. She was a good girl, nice gal. Uh, go along, you know, she wasn't a prima donna or anything, um, and she, you could joke with her, and uh, she was great, she was a fine actress, I mean, boy, she, she, she is a fine actress. She was no occasionally on, on a series, and I know uh, this was right at the end of your acting career, before you got behind the camera with producing and everything, uh, Kochak the Night Stalker, what was it like being on that show, because I love that show, Darren McGavin, it was great. Yeah, um, well, that's a strange story. I uh, was over at uh, Paramount producing the life story of Satchel Paige uh, for a proposed movie of the week. And um, um, I got a call from the head of casting at Universal that I do when I was doing a lot of acting. I, they asked me to do them a favor on some, some promotion or I don't know what it was, but I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it for you. So I did that, and now out of the blue, I've got offices over at Paramount. This head of casting uh, called and said, Hey, Jimmy, we've got something here, and uh, uh, could you show up tomorrow to play this part on the thing? And I'm like, mm, Yeah, if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Now, I, I, this was 1973, I right, think. And yeah. this, I quit acting in 68. And so he, would, he called out of the blue. Well, I found out he was quitting as the head of casting for Universal. And for some reason, he must have felt he owed me a favor. That's all I can think of. You yeah, know. There you go, tying and, up limbs. Said, I don't care uh, the money, I'll give you whatever you want, a special billing, 
it's just one day, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, okay. So I went over there, and then uh, it was supposed to be on a cruise ship going to Hawaii or something. So I asked the prop man, I said, do you have a couple lays or something I could wear in this scene to make it look like, you know, we're a big Hawaiian thing? And the guy was supposed to be an ex-priest, but he drinks a lot. So uh, they did priests to bless the bullets because they were going to shoot the vampire with them or something. I don't know. And that was the part. And I remember with uh, the star of the show, Darren McGavin, right. uh, we were sitting there and they said, uh, Jimmy, this is Darren McGavin. Darren, this is Jimmy Arkham. Uh, how do you do, sir? He said, you know, I met my wife on a, on, on a set. And I said, oh, yeah? Well, I like you, but I don't want to marry you. Uh, everybody, just like you, laughed and, you know, <laughs> was taken back. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it was a day's work, and that's how I did that show. Wow. And, you know, I wasn't acting, I wasn't looking for any parts, but this guy felt he owed me something. They had a casting, so... Now, I, under- I, I understand that you had even, and maybe you can tell us w- what happened with it, if there's a story or not, but you had even uh, done a pilot for a TV rendition of Andy Hardy where you would be taking over the role for, of course, Mickey Rooney did it in the films, right? Yes, uh-huh. I had done a spinoff pilot for the Donna Reed show, and they did uh, with William Wyndham, and... Um, he moves out of town to live on a farm with his wife. And I was their kind of farm boy, you know, to do chores and stuff around the. So they, in fact, uh, uh, Tony Owen, who was Don Reed's husband, called me at home. He said, Jimmy, how you doing? I said, oh, fine, fine. He said, what's the matter? Don't you want to work with me? <laughs> yeah, I want to work with you. Well, we're trying to get you to sign to do this pilot for us, the spinoff for the Donna Reed show, and your agents aren't even very cooperative. I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to do it. Yeah, whatever it is, I'll do it. So uh, I signed to do that. Now I get a call. I finished this pilot and doing a couple other shows, and I get a call from my agent. Uh, they, uh, Al Fisconi, head of casting for MGM, want you to come out and meet the producers of a series called Andy Hardy. They think it'd be great for Andy Hardy. I said, I, I've been hearing for three years they want that. Now, I live a long ways from Culver City, mm-hmm. you know, schlepping across town. And I said, look, they, they're looking for somebody. They're looking for somebody 5'4", five, 5'6". Five, you know, they want the Mickey Rooney reincarnated or something. Now, I've heard too many stories. I, I don't want to go. And besides, I'm under contract to to Tony Owen and Columbia Television, mm-hmm. you know, that pilot I did for them. And, oh, okay, well, I'll tell them. So, um, five minutes later, calls back. Uh, they, they don't care. <laughs> they want to meet you. <laughs> you just go to the studio and meet the producer? Okay, all right, okay. So I uh, drive out there and go to Al Trisconi's office, and he walks me over to the producer, and out of the building that I'm t- looking, I know where I'm going, comes this singing star of the day. Um, um, and I go, what's he here? I, I thought you said <laughs> you. I was the only one that was, you know, I just talked to Al. I <laughs> knew Al. And I said, well, what is that? I thought that, that the... And he said, no, 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 this was just a favor for somebody. Don't worry about it, Jimmy. They want to meet with you. And I said, we're walking into the building, and here comes this, this guy. I mean, I, everybody knows who he is. But, you know, he isn't up for the part. He is wrong for the part. We don't want him for the part. We just did a favor for his agent. That's it. Okay. So I go in and meet the producer of this Andy Hardy thing. And so he says, okay, well, let's read. I said, I, I don't cold read it, <laughs> you know. He said, oh. I said, so I'll just go out there. He said, no, no, no. You and I'll stay here. I'll leave. <laughs> leave the same office. <laughs> so I go, oh, okay. So I ran through it a few times. He gets a pace of, of the, stairs, the scene and everything. And then Al and I go over it. And I said, well, what do you think, Al? Is this what they're looking for? No, no, Jimmy. Just do it your way. That's fine. Just do it the way you do the thing. That's why they wanted to meet you. Yeah, okay. And so he leaned around. He opened the door, and 
he's ready. <laughs> so the producer comes walking back into his office. So he sits there and he says, okay, let's go. So I read it and find a line. I look up. Okay, that's it. So he says, uh, I don't care who you're under contract to. You're Andy Hardy and I'll do whatever it takes. You wow. are going to be Andy Hardy. Wow. I said, oh, oh, mm. oh, wow, great. Oh, oh, wow. You know, I was overwhelmed. You know, I said, well, I hope you work it out. It's nice meeting you. And <laughs> I left. <laughs> then they traded. Carol Lindley was under contract to MGM. Ah. So they traded Carol Lindley to do Diamond Head. And, and they gave MGM me <laughs> for <laughs> Carol Lindley. <laughs> Uh, a lot of money that they had to pay off Donna Reed's company to get my services now. So here I am. You over got to be MGM, from. Party, <laughs> and now we finish the show, and um, you, know, you keep hearing stuff. I was I waited for like nine months. They they uh, the NBC they did it with NBC, and they said okay, uh, they sold it and um, told MGM it's Sunday uh, opposite Lassie. Hmm. Uh, and the studio said, no. No. Uh, Andy Hardy is known for the 40s, 30s, and 40s. And we, um, we would need the audience for Wednesday night at 9 o'clock right. for this hmm. show. Seven o'clock, the kids they don't know Andy Hardy. No, right. no, we're not going to deficit finance millions of dollars and do uh, thirty some odd shows for you, and then it doesn't go, and then we've lost money. They and they said so. We'll just wait for Wednesday night, or they, Wednesday is picked Wednesday. Right, it could have been Thursday night or whatever, but night late. The other audience, and they never gave it to them. Oh, wow. So they wow. kept picking up my option and paying me and paying me. And then they said no. So, well, okay, so now I'm back sitting in uh, Tony Owen's office at uh, uh, Screen Gyms. And uh, my buddy that I met on uh, Don Reed, uh, uh, on uh, Ozzie and Harriet, um, he, he was a big rookie of the year with the Rams and mm -hmm. very popular star Rams and Tony Owen was a big and baseball fan and so I said oh a friend of mine would like to meet you Charlie Brin oh Charlie Brin oh god yeah well, come on in anytime okay so I tell Charlie okay uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock whatever yeah okay so we go over there and he's talking to Charlie about football and all this kind of stuff and then he turns to me he said how's that uh, thing over at MGM going I said nah they just released me didn't work. He said, oh. And he leaned over to his phone and he called, hi, hello. You know the show, uh, not next week, but the week after with so-and-so? Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Hawkins is going to play that part. And mm. the guy went, uh, he said, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Turned to me and said, welcome back. And that was it. Oh, <laughs> well, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> Gee. Wow. Yeah. You know, I got to mention a couple more things here. Uh, sure. you, you mentioned Zotz, William Castle. God, what a legend. I mean, he's a big thing to this radio station here. Uh, did you enjoy that? What was it like working with William Castle? And Tom Poston. I didn't like him at all. I didn't care for him. Didn't really get along with him. Um, I just thought, I, I just I didn't care for him. Right. The way he worked. Him. He, I don't think it's such a big deal. Uh, I like Tom Poston, and Mike Mazurki, worked with them, and this girl's Demi Norris, I was the boyfriend. <laughs> That's all I ever played. A friend <laughs> or a boyfriend. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I don't know, I didn't enjoy it. You know, there, the there's one it. other... When I was doing it, Ozzy Nelson called. Oh, right. I Ozzy Nelson, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> There's one other director that a lot of people said they've had trouble with, and I believe he was a director of Gidget. We're talking about William Asher. Did you work with William Asher? Because we have, you know, we know William. We knew William Asher. We spent a lot of time with him, became friends with him, was the nicest guy in the world. But there's so many actors that said he was kind of gruff. 
Well, I worked with Bill Asher on a Shirley Temple Presents. Um, and I liked it. Yeah, it was fine. You know, that was kind of a live show uh, back in 62. Or Shirley Temple Theater, do you yeah. remember yeah. that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, in color, in color. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and uh, I did that with uh, Frankie Avalon. Wow. And Frankie Avalon came up to me and said, oh, I got to you see you on Annie Oakley. What a pleasure it is to work with you. And I go, no, no, it's my pleasure. Oh, my God. Frankie Avalon. Oh. So uh, did that show, and Bill Asher was the director, and uh, uh, the jukebox was supposed to be playing a Frankie Avalon song, and I lip synced along with it, like, you know, like you do when you hear a popular song. You go along with it so Bill Asher came down and sat and he said okay everybody it's real good and Jimmy you know, do that thing where you're lip syncing like you're you know, singing along with Frankie that was a good good thing oh okay <laughs> so uh, I don't know it's just, I'm, su- I'm surprised you didn't uh, story. a very nice man I'm surprised yeah. you didn't uh, invite Frankie Avalon to the uh, party with Deborah Wally they knew each <laughs> other from the uh, the beach party films yeah that's right yeah they did some those beach parties. Yeah, she did some stuff over at AIP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, now, uh, now that was up to her. This was uh, a, just a party that all of us invited friends that were close with us and um, some of the people, Will Hutchins, uh, we invited him and you know, just a lot, a lot of people. Well, my friend's going to be glad to hear you invited Will Hutchins. He's a big friend of his. Has him on his radio show all the time, and, and I know you're oh, with yeah, him. Oh, yeah, that guy. And uh, when we were on the set of uh, doing uh, uh, Spin Out, uh, we were standing by the water cooler and, and uh, just shooting the breeze. And uh, I said, well, where are you from? He said, oh, you, you, would, you wouldn't know. Uh, it's an area in L.A. Uh, oh, really? Like where? He said, oh, it's called Atwater. At that water, I was born on Atwater Avenue, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we we uh, talked all about Atwater. <laughs> so he's a very nice guy. He's a very very nice person. Well, he's I have to I have to ask you yeah. one more thing here, and then we'll we'll wrap this up. We got a little special treat for for everybody here that we want to ask you about. But one more thing, I want to do like uh, three sixty. We started talking about it's a wonderful life. Your, your scenes with, with Jimmy Stewart, of course, it was the famous tinsel scene, and I guess that yeah. was just like an ad-lib that Frank Capra told you to do, just put tinsel on Jimmy's head. And then the That's scene right. where Jimmy's all emotional, he's crying, he's hugging you, he's pulling you forward and, and kissing you. I guess there was a story about that uh, it kind of like burned your face. It's like the sand mask you had on was burned. Like, can you talk about those two scenes with the tinsel and with Jimmy Stewart where he was crying and hugging you? Yeah, right. Uh, so... Uh Director, okay, you're sitting on his lap, and now give him, you know, told the prop man, give him some tinsel. I want you to put tinsel on his, and and you're listening to him, and you know you pretended you were going to scare him. And that isn't that something? Here I am wearing a Santa Claus, and I'm going, oof, oof, like I'm supposed to scare him. Uh-huh. Oh, Santa! Oh my God! Don't attack me. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> so um, uh, we do that scene, and then all of a sudden he pulls me into it. Now, he didn't just, you know, kind of grab and pull. He jerked me towards him. And and when he did that, the mask that I was wearing around my neck, I wasn't wearing it on my face. It was on, on my neck. It would hike up every time, and the inside of the mask was like uh, sandpaper. Mm-hmm. And when it went, and it went so fast, it just scraped across my chin or my cheek. And I go, oh, my God, that hurt. <laughs> it, I mean, it hurt. It was just... Like, oh, geez. So we rehearsed it two or three times, and there again, he just pulls me in. Oh, my God. I thought, when is he going to stop this? <laughs> so we rehearsed it three times and shot it a couple of times, and every match would hike up and scrape. But I knew enough, this is strange, a four-year-old kid would know this, um, that I had to pretend it was the first time he was doing this. I couldn't flinch no. or anything telegraph that, uh-oh, something's going to happen. <laughs> this guy's going to grab me and it's going to hurt. And no, it didn't. And uh, uh, so that nobody knew it. It's just me. Right. But I, I, it was vivid in my memory that that hurt. And uh, 
uh, that's the scene that you were talking about. Right, and uh, then with the, the tinsel, Frank Caffer just kind of mentioned that you do that. Yeah, yeah, he just, it's always giving me business. Like, uh, uh, I would go over the script with my mom at night, and they said, well, you're going to be here, and you do this, and blah, blah, blah. Is that you, Daddy? Can you sing, Daddy? Oh, okay, I say that. And then he would give me business. Then uh, we got off, and we were to go to the kitchen and follow Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and my older brother. Uh, we followed him towards the kitchen. And now Frank Capra uh, is into the scene, and then he tells everybody to stop. Jimmy Stewart, Don Reed, stop everybody. And then he he squatted down at, with me, eye to eye. He said, see where you are right here? And he looked at the, the carpeting. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, I see. Yes, sir. And he said, I want you to pull on this man's coattail. As you come out of that room, you keep pulling on his coattail. But when you get right here, you say, excuse me, real loud. Yeah. Okay. So we did that three times. He stopped three different times, the whole scene, and then explained to me where we are. Now say, excuse me again. Okay, I will. Okay, sir. So uh, we did that. And um, I remember the second time I was supposed to say it, I didn't say it. And I knew in my mind I was going, oh, you're supposed to say, excuse me. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. <laughs> so... Uh, but the older boy picked it up, picked up the cue. I just dropped it, didn't say it right away. So the little boy, the older brother, well, how do you spell this, uh, Daddy, or about a car or something? He, What's the matter? Don't you like our car? And he, oh, well, I'm sorry, Daddy. And so in between that, right, uh, maybe count to three, I said, excuse me again, mm -hmm. but not where I'm supposed to say it. And then I said it the last time. Mm -hmm. So now we flash back years later. Uh, we're over at the Motion Picture Academy. I'm a member of the Motion Picture Academy. And he there's director's choice. So it was Frank Capra was going to show his favorite film, It's a Wonderful Life. And he talked to the audience and everything. Well, uh, before he was going on, I uh, went up and introduced myself. And we started shooting the breeze, and I asked him some questions. But I did ask him, I said... Because he, I asked him, what's the most difficult scene that was shot in the whole movie? What, what's the toughest one you had? He said, the scene with you kids. <laughs> <laughs> you were only, you were only four. Give you a break. I mean, <laughs> but the, the, no, no, no. You guys were great. There's so much going on in that scene. There's so many levels. Yes, yeah. you know, you have the kid going. Uh, how do you spell this, Dad? You're burping, pulling on the thing. Uh, the girls pank, uh, banging on the piano, and all these things were were funny. But I didn't want the people to laugh at the scene. I wanted them to laugh with the scene. Yeah. Right. And I had all those things going. He's lost the 8,000. The wife is thinking, what? He is himself, you know. Then he goes ballistic, and he said that was very difficult. And that's all stuff with us kids. Took 12 days to shoot. Wow. Um, so... But I asked him at the thing, I said, you know, I didn't say it at the right time, <laughs> uh, the second excuse me. He said, I know. I said, well, why did you not just say cut and let's start over? He said, because it seemed uh, real. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, when you're, when you're four years old, Jimmy, do you really know your acting? Do you really know what you're doing? Do you think it's just like playtime with some new friends? Or? No, I knew this was business. And I had to do certain things at certain times, and I had to, you know, pick up cues. The little girl stopped, and the, and they said, "Oh, we're going to sing tonight." And then I turned to them, "You gonna? You can you sing that?" Oh, wow! Yeah. And I have never, ever in my career ever. Uh, I always look at me as an audience, and I go, "You should have waited on that line." The timing was just a little off. You remember the next time you get in this kind of situation? And I could always tell when I did something, you know, and I said, oh, that was perfect. Oh, you did that real good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always knew that. I, was, I could step outside of myself and critique myself and said, nah, you should have done this differently. Wow. I'm surprised the director didn't tell me something or whatever it was. All my career, you know, I could do that. And it was somebody else. And I said, well, he's got to do better than that. Or he's good. He's real good at this one. So um, it's, I don't know. Uh, but 
it was great doing uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and it's the longest lived thing, and it's just touched uh, everybody, uh, and it's just a wonderful experience. I, I don't know if you know or not, but two years ago I requested to go to, to Attica Prison. No. And no. I wanted to show the film to the prisoners, these hardened prisoners. And so um, I told the people in Seneca Falls that the chief of police was uh, the uh, chief of police for 20 years. And I said, I want to ask you, you, you could probably do something with this. Uh, I want to go to Attica and show the movie, and I want to talk to the people afterwards, the prisoners. Oh, okay. So they made some calls. They said, it's tough. We're not getting anywhere. Well, somebody knew Cuomo's mom, and Cuomo's dad and Frank Capra were friends. Oh. Oh. So uh, they asked me to make up a letter, and they would give it to Cuomo's mom, who was a big fan of It's a Wonderful Life and the It's a Wonderful Life Museum in Seneca Falls. Mm -hmm. So she handed my letter to uh, Cuomo and said, and he read it, and he told his people, uh, um, he called the superintendent of all prisons, uh, 90 some odd prisons in New York, and said, uh, this guy from the movie wants to get into Attica, make it happen, will you? And so one night, we drove out of Seneca Falls to Attica and went in there. What an experience. That wow. was, oh my God. It's incredible. And we, <clears throat> all the guys had seen the film, and they filled up their chapel. That's where we had the question and answer Q&A in the chapel of the prison in Attica. And these guys were so well prepared. They had notes and very intelligent observations of the movie. And I said, now we're going to start this Q&A and blah, blah, blah. So you ask us anything you want about the movie. And uh, I said, but first, I have the first question. Did you guys see anything in uh, the George Bailey part of him getting a second chance in life, like you guys are getting a second chance in life now. Oh, that's great. And, yes, I saw that George Bailey did. He got a chance to see what life would have been like if he had never been born, and that was his second chance. And yes, and oh my God, the evening, two hours went like lickety split. Wow. And so one guy at the end of it, are you okay on your time? Maybe you want oh, to- Oh no, no, no go, fine, ahead. go ahead. Okay, so uh, one guy uh, said, uh, Mr. Hawkins, uh, I have a program here. Well, they gave programs to everybody about the, the movie, about the, uh, I brought Zuzu with me, and uh, they asked us questions. And they had this little program that talked all about this. He said, would you sign my program? Uh, so I looked at the superintendent of all the prisons sitting next to me, and he looked at the head uh, guard and they went yeah uh, and then he, and the superintendent said now you'll uh, uh, they'll come up to the edge of the stage there'll be somebody there at the edge of the stage and then they'll walk it up to you and Carolyn and you can sign it I said no no I don't want that right I want to sit on the edge of the stage and have them come by I want to meet them in person and sign their thing one and then the superintendent again the head of guard heard me tell him that and then he made some art and all these people they took all the guys took them out the door down the hall waiting to get in with their things and I signed and Carolyn signed every one of them oh my god that's wonderful everyone and a guy said uh, to me um, would you sign this to my mom Aww. it's her favorite movie and I want to give her something that nobody can and I went, sure, I'd be more than happy. What's your mom's name? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, and just all these these guys, the, the questions and the, their attitude towards us while they went by and, and got us to sign their, their little program. Um, it's just an incredible experience. It was just, oh, I was just so happy to have been there to be able to touch their lives, you know, because yes. they knew everything about the film. They asked questions and oh my god they were very intelligent well i, I don't want to forget to mention that you did write five it's a wonderful life books we have your uh, it's a wonderful life trivia book it's one of my favorite books 
Oh, okay. And and the one yeah. that you wrote I want to talk about is you wrote one uh, explain It's a Wonderful Life from the view of your character Tommy to children. Oh, yeah. It's a Wonderful Life for Kids book. Yeah, right. I Because uh, we meet hundreds and hundreds of people, and they all tell us the same thing. Oh, when I was a little boy, I used to sit and watch this with my parents, and now I'm married, and I sit, and my kids, and now they got their kids right with them. He said, look, uh, here's my son, uh, and he watches the the movie with us and, and I was always oh how are you do you, you understand banking and building the loans <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't it little oh, kid you know he's like seven or something yeah yeah and he's kind of shy so I said I'm going to write a book about for kids from a kid's point of view and so they'll understand what that movie was about yeah it's great and, uh, from their from a kid's point of view and that's why I picked it my character to tell the story so thank you for bringing that up that, it was a fun book to to write i wrote it in just a couple hours and i called a publisher one of the biggest publishers for kids books in the united states and by some freak thing i asked for this guy's office the head of uh, 12 or 14 uh children's books under the banner of this main publishing and the guy answered I said oh it's Mr. I'm in he said and it was like a lunch time or something and the secretary's out and he picked up the phone I said oh oh, oh it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, you ever hear of a film called It's Wonderful Life <laughs> 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 I said well I'm Tommy Bailey Tommy Bailey oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so he talked all about what that film has done for him and little stories he said, so how can I help you, Mr. Hawkins? What? I said, well, I've written a book called It's Wonderful Life for Kids. It's just blah, 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 blah. He said, oh, my God. Okay, let me tell you something. Uh, within two days, you're, I'm going to have a lady call you. She's the president of this division of ours. We, uh, that publishes Winnie the Pooh, and I feel that It's Wonderful Life is in that category. And uh, she'll be calling you within three days, and then you tell, I'm not going to pitch it to her. You do a great job. So you tell her what you just told me, okay? Okay. And you got my number and everything. You said, okay, remember within two or three days, this lady will call you. Oh, okay. So hung up. 30 minutes later, the phone rings. And, Hi, <laughs> Mr. So-and-so asked me. I'm the president of the... the, the <laughs> there you go. So what do you... Uh, how can I help you? And I told her what I told you. And she says, do you have anything on paper? I said, I have it all down. But I don't know your template of how you uh, form a kid's book. Yeah, layout, right. template, yeah. <laughs> Script, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know that layout. She said, well, I'm going on a vacation for uh, 10 days. I'll be gone. I'll call you when we get back and then talk to you about it, okay? I thought, oh, that's fair enough. Just send me what you have. You say it's like a script? Yeah, it's just, you know, yeah, so, right. Okay, here's the uh, email address, and, and I'll call you in 10 days. That Tuesday, I get an email back, and all it said on the email thing, is this what you meant? And she put it all in their template. Wow. Perfect. And she said, I want it. Don't sell it to anybody else. We're going to have a deal. I'll be back, and uh, we're in business. I said, oh, great. Hey, I'm glad you liked it. And that was it. The thing so tons. Wow. Are, are all five of your books still available? Or are they all, you know, still in print? No, no, out of print. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, you can get eBay and stuff like that. But um, a lot of people bring them to signing, so yeah. And when we meet the people there, they have stuff, or they buy it there at the uh, museum. I would love to mail you my copy with return postage if you could sign it. Oh sure, be happy to. Yeah, of course. So we, we have to topic. we have to mention one more thing as we go. Tiffany wants to bring up because she loves yeah. rock stars, <laughs> and and you were a big teen idol because you got into putting out a <laughs> record. You even did your own release. You had your own single. Yes, I know. I wrote it, and I proved to everybody I cannot sing. <laughs> it People was good. Sing. I liked it. It was it was fun. <laughs> Do you sing? I said, I talk out of tune. Are you kidding? <laughs> I can't sing. I love singing. I, you know, I just love that stuff. But I just I just didn't quite make it. It's, it's, 
but I did it, and and I wanted to do it, so I did it and got it published and out, but it didn't sell a heck of a lot. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun to do, and that's it's nice of you to bring it up. And and the best part is you didn't play any of it. That's even better. Yeah, but you don't know. See, we're going to actually, as we're ending this, and, and we want to say goodbye here, but we're going to have you... you- me sign your book. <laughs> we have we have got to play your record because the people want to hear. Please, I mean, I want to sleep tonight. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Play it on somebody else's show. Uh, they're coming. Okay, so that's very kind. It's called Sure Do, and it was like Ricky Nelson's uh, "Poor Little Fool." I kind of I, oh, I like that. I want to. You know, sure do feel bad. Did I do yeah. love you? Sure do. Did, 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 did. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was different. It was quite an experience. I think I was fifteen at the time, <laughs> so I could say I was. Uh, anyway, well, but, everybody uh, did a record back then. Thank you for, for tonight, and I hope uh, I answered everything you wanted in the way you wanted it, and got the information over to you and your listeners. I thank you for having me and. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and uh, a, a great New Year. And I know it's going to be better than this one. It's got to uh, be. So um, I appreciate you uh, uh, asking me to be on your show. Well, but I don't. I don't want to be corny, Jimmy, but you really have had a wonderful life. You really have. I have. Yes. I really have. I just, just terrific. The Thank best. you so much, sir. Such an honor. All right. And All right. keep, keep that show going, okay? Okay. We will. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Out there at Lake Hughes. That's great. Yeah. I, like I said, I spent years there. We we built the cabin ourselves. My dad brought some guys from Universal uh, that where he was working after World War II. They, he was in World War II. And uh, they'd come up weekends, and we'd build stuff. And, and my dad said, uh, now we're going to have a swimming pool. So you and your brother dig here. And then we'll have a swimming pool. It's out front. So, oh, gosh, we're digging and digging. And they say, okay, that's enough. And it turned out to be that's where the cesspool was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm inviting you up next year up here in Lake Hughes for a Halloween party, you know? Because... Oh, great. Great. I know the guy that has the uh, the the hay rag uh, concession. So Perfect. we'll get him there. All righty. <laughs> All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank and you, it's Jimmy. Been a, my pleasure. Have a, have a Merry Christmas. Okay, thank right. you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.